Thanks for coming to this, this session on the... Uh, it's really the future of, of networking as applied to digital transformation. Um, I, I trust everybody went to Pat's session this morning and there was a great line in, in uh, his presentation where he talked about how NSX is central to everything we do at VMware. And so what I'm really going to talk about today is how NSX and networking more broadly plays into the way companies can transform themselves. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a story about digital transformation. Um, actually, I'll start with a disclaimer. You've probably seen this before, forward-looking statements, et cetera. Okay, so uh, you may recognize someone in that picture. I'm a pretty serious runner. Um, let me just do a quiz. How many people have been running outside in Las Vegas this week? Congratulations to that gentleman in the second row and, and me. So that's two of us. Um, so that gives you some sign of how, how crazy I am. Uh, I, I really, really enjoy running. I've done it competitively for almost all my life. That's a, a, a national competition in San Francisco that I ran in a couple of years ago. Sort of national cross-country championship for old people is roughly what it was called. Uh, so like most people who are serious about running, I, uh, I have a digital device that I wear with me all the time and it tracks all kinds of interesting data. Um, probably more interesting to me than to many of you, but I then, like many competitive runners, take that data and upload it to a personal tracking service. What almost everybody in the, I'd say, US-based competitive running community uses is a thing called Strava. So Strava is a good example of a classic digital native business. They collect all this data from people wearing stuff and they've created this amazing social website where you can share all the things that you're doing running. I'm sure one of the reasons why I decided to go and run outside yesterday when it was uh, 42 Celsius, 107 Fahrenheit, was I thought it'll make for a good post on Strava. And uh, you can see some of my other activities there, running around Taiwan and Hong Kong as part of my, my role as now covering the Asia Pacific region. Um, so all kinds of good stuff can be tracked here. You can track your shoe usage, for example. I go through a pair of shoes about every six to eight weeks, and Strava will very kindly tell me when it's time to replace a pair of shoes by telling me how far I run on any given pair. So this is where the digital world sort of meets the physical world. You can't just go and buy shoes online. You, you can buy shoes online if you want, but you need, if you're serious, to go and actually see the physical shoe and talk to somebody who understands what the shoe does. And so I actually go to shoe stores. And Nike was also mentioned in Pat's keynote this morning as an example of a company that's really embraced digital transformation. And so you can actually go and read like Harvard Business School studies about how Nike changed their approach to embrace digital technology. And you know, I think a good way of thinking about what digital transformation looks like is when you take a company that's in the business of selling a physical product and they start embracing digital technology to change the way they develop that product, the way they sell it, the way they market it, and the way they interact with their customers. And so you go inside the Nike store, there's lots of magnificent shoes. Obviously, I can spend a lot of time in a place like this. And then you can pull out your app and find out information about the shoes, you can customize them with your own color scheme, you can order them there. So you can actually now start to blend your digital experience with your physical experience. And so this really is a very simple example of digital transformation where the boundary between the physical and the digital is being blurred and where a traditional digital, sorry, a traditional physical company is embracing digital technology to change the way they do business. And you know, we heard multiple examples of that in this morning's keynote. Companies like Cisco, a food service company, embracing digital technology to change the way they interact. And the imperative to do that is, as, as I think the gentleman said on stage, you need to disrupt yourself before somebody else disrupts you. And I think we can all think of companies that might be disrupting the food service business right now. And Reed Hastings, the, uh, one of the founders of Netflix, said, you know, companies rarely die from moving too fast. They frequently die from moving too slowly. That is the imperative to embrace digital transformation is you need to be able to disrupt yourself before somebody else disrupts you. And of course, Netflix was the famous example of disrupting the traditional physical business of video rentals and DVD rentals. And you know, the, the story of the, that's very well known. So digital transformation then, it's a real thing. And 
I think we've heard enough people talk about digital transformation over the last, you know, five years or maybe 10 years that sometimes it's tempting to think it's all just a whole lot of hype. That everybody just wants to sell you something. They just want to tell you digital transformation is this thing that you need to embrace. But I actually think it's, it, there's some really compelling reasons to believe that digital transformation is more than just hype at this point. And it's that the technologies now exist to enable every company to embrace digital transformation. And if we were to take just one simple example, the fact that you can now go to a public cloud, provision some virtual machines, some other services, and start deploying a new application in a matter of minutes is a reason that digital transformation is real. That you now have all the capabilities, you or other people in your business have the capabilities to start deploying new applications, inventing new capabilities. This has to be coupled with a vision for what the business wants to do. It doesn't do you any good to just have technology. And history is littered with stories of companies that took some new technology into the organization and failed to leverage it. So you need to have this vision of how I'm gonna change the business. But once you have that vision, now the technologies really exist to help you execute that vision and to change your business and to be on the sort of Netflix side of the equation rather than the blockbuster side. So what I want to talk about in today's presentation is the central role that networking plays in digital transformation. And uh, I was chatting with one of my colleagues before uh, the session started. Um, clearly, we've got a lot of capacity here to accommodate more people than have currently walked in. Um, I think, you know, at VMworld, we often really like to talk about products, and there's no product name in this, in this talk's title. Um, as you, you may know if you've read my bio, I worked on the NSX product for a long time, so you will hear some references to NSX through here. And as we get further into the presentation, you'll hear me say some things about how NSX can help you sort of realize your digital transformation goals. But so what I want to start by talking about is why networking is so important in digital transformation. How many people in the room are people who focus on networking as part of their day job? Yeah, th those are the, probably the typical target audience of this. So for those people, I think there's a really great story here that you have the ability to make a big difference to your company and really to make a bigger difference than you have made in the past. You know, I'm, a, I'm a networking person. I've been doing networking for close to 30 years. And you know, sometimes networking people are viewed as kind of this little silo of the organization that you know, they, they sit there with their routers and make sure that you know, BGP works correctly and they have this sort of arcane knowledge. What I want to argue today is that while that knowledge is good, there's the opportunity to have a much broader impact than just being the person who's the most expert in, in routing protocols. So I'm going to break this up into three parts. I'll start by talking about how to modernize your data center in such a way that you will set yourself up to be successful with digital transformation. Then I'll talk for a significant chunk of time about the importance of aligning developers with IT. This, I think, is one of the great challenges of digital transformation, that if you're going to do something innovative, at some point you're going to probably have to engage with developers to develop innovative products or innovative applications. Frequently, the needs of developers are not well aligned with the capabilities that IT can deliver. And that is, in fact, one of the reasons why public clouds are so popular is because a developer can go straight to a public cloud, get productive without waiting for IT to do something. There are lots of reasons why that isn't an ideal outcome, and that's something I'll spend some time talking about in the middle of the talk. And then finally, I'll talk about people and process. That this is not something we often like to talk about as technology people, but it's incredibly important to realize that the best technology won't be effective unless you think about how people use it and what processes do you have in place to leverage that technology. So those are the things I'll, I'll talk about in the remainder of the, of the hour. So first of all, I think you've heard by now the idea from, from VMware that you should be modernizing your data center. Clearly, if you're going to be successful in this world of digital transformation, you're, you're going to have to have a modern data center. So what does that look like? So the modern data center, and you know, if we think modern data centers, we can think of the most advanced data centers from people like Google or Facebook or Amazon. They all look roughly like this. They use standardized components, x86 servers, commodity storage, standardized networking. 
modular components that you can add more as you need to grow capacity. Very scalable, so you can just scale out by adding these modular components. Then a layer of software wrapped around that to provide high availability because you can't run a digital business if your infrastructure is unavailable. And typically focusing on a cost-effective solution by making sure that we don't build super expensive dedicated components, but rather use these general purpose components that are less expensive. And I think if anybody comes to VMworld, we pretty much assume that they understand compute virtualization. But you know, what we've been saying for the last several years is you have to do more than just virtualize compute to have a modern data center. You have to virtualize storage and you have to virtualize networking. And in fact, there's rather more to it than just that as well. You need to wrap a layer of management software around that. And I think we frequently neglect the importance of management. We, we love to focus on products rather than solutions, but you don't have a real solution unless you can automate everything, unless you can monitor everything, unless you can troubleshoot things. And so the, the fundamental pillars of compute, networking, and storage need to be wrapped up in a layer of management software before you can begin to talk about having a modern data center. Increasingly, we'll also be looking at the role of containers in this world, and I'll say more about that later in the presentation. And as you may have gathered from some of the comments Pat made this morning, there'll be a lot more talk about containers tomorrow in the, in the general session. But I'm going to talk today about how containers play into a world where we're using modern approaches to networking. Containers are clearly one of the bright, shiny objects of 2017. But again, just as with my earlier comments about digital transformation, the reality actually is measuring up here because it is really changing the way people deploy and manage applications. And it's very important that we build infrastructure that is set up to support these containerized applications. So let me just zoom in on the network virtualization part. Uh, how many people here have been to at least one session on NSX either this year or previous years? Okay, so maybe half the room and maybe the other half are just shy or sleepy after lunch. Um, so I don't think most of you need to be given a tutorial on NSX, but I'm just going to give you the one slide version of what NSX is at its heart. NSX and network virtualization more broadly is the faithful reproduction of networking and security services in software. And that means all the things that you're accustomed to thinking of that come in a box, routing, switching, firewalling, all of those things, which in many cases, if you're an old networking person like me, you think of a physical object when you think of those things, they now come in software. That software can be deployed anywhere on any infrastructure, and it can be managed in software and automated using other, other pieces of software to interact with it. We'll show you some examples of that later in the presentation. So anything that you might want to do in a network, which you would have historically done by touching a piece of hardware, today can be done with a piece of software that is independent of the underlying hardware, just in the same way that today you can provision any operating system you want on any x86 server, independent of what kind of, of server that is. OK, so modernizing the data center is about adopting really best practices around the virtualization of compute, networking, and storage, wrapping the whole thing in a layer of automation. I'm going to spend a bit more time talking about the alignment of developers and IT, because I think this is really fundamental to why networking is so important in digital transformation. So as you, I'm sure you know, applications today don't just run in one place. They're typically distributed systems. Most of us are familiar with three-tier applications where you distribute the application across a front, middle, and back end. But increasingly, this is only getting more and more true as applications move to microservice architectures. We see an increasing level of distribution. So a modern application today could be made up of, of dozens or even more different components which run in different places and interact with each other through some kind of API. So by, almost by definition, applications need networking and the developers building those applications need networking because they need all these components to communicate with each other. But I'm guessing not that many people in the room are developers. And I don't know if I can see any man buns in the room either. Um, but so enough about developers. Let's talk about the people who work in IT. So 
I think I, a few chuckles make me think probably a few people can relate to this picture. So the IT team is expected to do a lot. And you know, I think what I, one of the things I learned last year at v VMworld where I spent a fair amount of time talking about how NSX could help you empower your developers was I actually got some feedback in, the, in, in my presentation review, which was like, boy, I wish that guy would stop talking about developers. So this year, I've, I've, that feedback's taken. Um, I'm going to talk about what the IT team can do to make your organization successful. And I'll say, to, um, even if you don't have developers in-house, ultimately, as an IT team, we have to be thinking about how do we either enable new applications to get deployed or new applications to get developed because that is the, the heart of digital transformation. So the IT team needs to make sure that the developers get the networking they need and they need to make sure that that, that networking is delivered in a way that meets the broader needs of the organization, which may well be different than what the developer perceives as the things that he or she needs. So historically, the IT team has been focused on a core set of challenges, things like making sure that everything stays secure, making sure that, that we're compliant with a variety of regulations, whether it's HIPAA or PCI or other policies that are set by the corporation. Maintaining costs. Nobody wants their IT budget to run out of control. Making sure that everything's available. It's all well and good to have a new application, but it needs to be available, and increasingly, it needs to be available 24-7 as we make these applications core to the way we do business. And we need to make sure that we're able to manage things like performance. The world only gets more complicated because whereas once upon a time, you could be thinking about doing all of those jobs on your private infrastructure, Today, it's increasingly true that some percentage of your workloads run on public clouds, whether it's IaaS, developers spinning up new VMs to develop new capabilities, or perhaps it's SaaS services. There's a much richer set of infrastructure that we're expected to manage while still maintaining security and cost and so on. So we need things like cross-cloud management, the ability to maybe migrate a workload from one cloud to another and maintain the same security posture in different environments. And then on top of all of that, the way that applications are designed and developed seems to change all the time. This time last year, I think most of us were talking about Docker as the bright, shiny object, and that was how everybody was going to develop applications. The, you know, this year, we're talking a lot more about Kubernetes and also about things like Pivotal Cloud Foundry. It seems like every month there's some whoop, flying clicker. Um, there's, uh, there's some new thing that sort of comes onto the landscape that we need to be able to deal with. So this is the sort of the complexity that we're asking IT people to deal with. And you know, this is what the typical developer's environment looks like. Uh, I, until recently, I lived in San Francisco, and any coffee shop was basically full of people doing development. And you know, this creates new challenges for the CIO. Um, that's uh, Bas Geyer, the CIO of uh, Dell and VMware, and that uh, question mark reads roughly WTF, as you've got the developer sitting on his laptop producing code, deploying it into a public cloud, the path between the developer's laptop and the public cloud is completely made up of infrastructure that the IT department doesn't own. And yet, if there is a security breach of that application, it's the CIO whose neck is on the line. So we've got this world where IT broadly is responsible for all the things that they've always been responsible for, security, cost, availability, and yet much of the infrastructure that they now are dealing with is not under their control. So what we have then is these two constituencies with different objectives. We have the developers who want to build applications and deploy them and just have them work, and they want to have the flexibility to use their latest, greatest container frameworks, the latest public cloud capabilities. And you've got IT that wants to apply the appropriate controls to make sure that everything runs correctly, that things are compliant, secure, cost-effective, and so on. If we, there's always a temptation to focus on only one of these two groups. I think in this audience, we, we certainly tend to focus heavily on the IT organization. In other environments, you'll find people focusing all the, you know, the other way over on developers. If we only focus on one con constituency, we're going to miss something. So the developers, they're building distributed applications. They need networking. But 
you know, if you could look at Kubernetes, for example, there's a decent amount of networking capability built into it. So if we only focus on the developer, you can probably find most of what they need is going to be provided through the native tooling of the application framework that they're using. If we only focused on IT, well, we just keep doing things the way we've always done them. We'd say, you know, is it a problem that it takes me three months to change a firewall rule? That's the way we've always done it. And so clearly we've got this mismatch of the way we've always done it in IT and you know, the way developers need things to happen or the way the, the lines of business need things to happen if they want things to happen in a hurry. And um, you know, I uh, actually had lunch with, with somebody from the IT organization of a big bank today. And you know, he's actually really embracing radical new ways of doing networking. And he said, you know, the biggest challenge that I face trying to get the broader adoption of that is people just want to keep doing it the way they've always done it before. And so this kind of starts to get into the people and process issues I'll, I'll touch on later. But you know, since you showed up at the session, I'm assuming that you, what you actually want to know about is how you can make your organization successful in a world of digital transformation. And that means we need to address both of these groups. We need to develop capabilities that meet the needs of developers, but also allow IT to have the controls they need. So let me show you a demo of how we can do this using modern technology. I'm just going to do a few slides of setup here. So we all hear, at least I certainly hear a lot about Kubernetes. Um, how many people here have heard a lot about Kubernetes recently? How many people here feel they could confidently give an explanation of what Kubernetes is? OK, so you two people can take a quick nap. Um, I, I actually went as far as to go and download the Kubernetes tutorial and install it on my laptop and run it so that I would feel at least confident enough to say I can give you a quick explanation of Kubernetes, good enough to set up a demo. So if you get nothing else out of this presentation, you should go out of here able to hold your own over a beer talking about Kubernetes for at least five minutes. So Kubernetes is a way of deploying and managing containerized apps. The idea is you have a certain amount of infrastructure that's called a cluster. A cluster is made up of a, a bunch of nodes. A node is basically a machine that can do useful work, typically a virtual machine. There's a thing called a deployment, which is roughly speaking an application, and there's a whole bunch of containers that run on the different nodes. If you zoom in on, on, on a node, a node could have many different containers running on it, could have many different applications. Bear in mind, a node is typically like a, a single virtual machine or a single physical machine. And sitting down there is actually a, a piece of code called the Docker runtime. So if you're trying to answer the question, what's the relationship between Kubernetes and Docker? That's a complicated question, but you can think of Docker provides the low level environment that lets you run a whole lot of containers on a single virtual machine. And then Kubernetes provides the orchestration that makes sure the right containers are running in the right place at the right time and doing all the things you want them to do. And then you can group things into pods. We probably don't need to say more about that. So let me just move on and, and uh, get to the actual demo. But so just to, just to quickly summarize, this is a way of managing applications in a modern environment that spins up and does the lifecycle management of a whole lot of containers so you can build complicated applications without manually provisioning a whole lot of stuff. So it kind of fits in that universe of you need management to automate things. So what does this have to do with networking? Well, if you were very, very careful reading all the press releases this morning, which I'm guessing most of you didn't do, um, you would have noticed that we just announced a new version of NSX called NSXT. NSXT has actually been around for a while, but NSXT 2.0 has just been announced. And what I'm going to demo in a minute or two is how NSXT can help you in a Kubernetes environment. So this is solving that problem that I alluded to earlier of letting the developer have what he or she wants, which is an environment to build applications using Kubernetes, while letting IT have what they want, which is the ability to set policies to control things like networking and security. And so this slide just goes into a bit more detail. And by the way, there are other presentations later in the week that will go into this in a lot more detail. But basically what we've got here is an NSX installation that does all the things that NSX does. It deploys networking and security in software in response to things that happen through the NSX API. 
The NSX API is connected to a thing called the NSX container plugin. And the NSX container plugin is talking to Kubernetes. So from the developer's point of view, this is going to look like completely standard Kubernetes. From the IT person's point of view, from the, the person who actually has access to the NSX manager, it's going to look like pretty standard NSX. What's going to happen at the end is we'll see all of the networking and security services that are needed by the application will get deployed automatically in response to actions taken by the developer in a way that's compliant with IT policy. All right, I think we're going to run the demo now. This is a recorded demo. I'm going to talk very fast, and then I'll probably stop and take a couple of questions so that you can make sure you understood what happened. Oh, it's not quite time yet. Sorry. One more slide, and then I'll go to the demo. Um, so the idea is we're going to show you a very, very simple application. It's going to look roughly like a restaurant reviewing application. So the business has an idea. They want a new application. The developer goes and builds the application using his favorite container framework and, and APIs that are familiar. In the background and in parallel to this, IT sets policy. And policy will be things like databases can't be connected to the internet and you know, typical policies like that. And then once the developer invokes the APIs to deploy the application, NSX will automatically deploy the networking and security services that are needed to meet those IT policies. It all comes together automatically in NSX and then you'll see the application deployed. All of this is going to happen in about two minutes. <clears throat> okay, so here we are sitting at the Kubernetes CLI. We've got a standard Kubernetes installation. There's some basic Kubernetes stuff there, and there's some NSX switches already that exist and NSX routers that already exist. They were automatically created as soon as we created the Kubernetes cluster. We're going to now deploy the application by invoking a single line and we're going to look at, this is the specification of the application. This is sitting up there on GitHub. It's a YAML file. We'll talk about YAML later. There's a whole specification of how many containers, how they connect to each other, what images to use. And at the bottom there, there's the name of the host where we're going to deploy this. We invoked that command, and a bunch of stuff is going to happen. We've now got the new application sitting in its new namespace. And when we go and look at NSX, there's now a new logical switch that got created automatically. And now let's just go and look at what Kubernetes is doing. We're switching back and forth here quite fast. There's some containers getting created, th actually three containers <clears throat> corresponding to a, a front end for the application, um, the back end and the middle application tier. So those are the three containers that we just deployed. We could scale this out with more containers. And now if we go and look at the logical switch that corresponds to this, we can see it's got some ports connecting to the three different tiers of the application. And let's see, if we go and dig onto the security side of this, we can see that we, we've got a security group called application tier that says if the tag equals application tier, then, the, then the, you get a security group applied. And this particular security group has some ports in it, actually just one, and it's the application server gets that policy applied. And again, going back into NSX, we can see the firewall rules that are getting applied to that. Everything was done there according to IT policy. And here is the front end of our application. It lets you vote. So that's the front end. It's talking to the database. The votes are getting tallied. And the votes are getting displayed on the screen there as we increment them. So you've got a front end talking to a database. It's all working well. <clears throat> now we're just going to go in and change one firewall rule in NSX and see what effect that has on the application. We just said drop the traffic between the, the application and the database. And when we look at the application again, you can see that we can no longer see the database. The data is not getting displayed. The votes are not getting counted. All right, I think that's the end of the demo. Um, so let me just take a quick pause there. So I know that went by pretty fast. So what we were seeing there was on the black screen was interactions with Kubernetes. That's the way a developer would deploy an application. A bunch of stuff had to happen before that. Code had to be written. The YAML file had to be created. But then the application could be deployed in the time it took me to show you that demo. In fact, rather less time than it took to show you the demo. We then went into NSX, and we looked at 
a bunch of the features in NSX. So we can see logical switches, logical routers, firewalls, all the networking and security features that NSX deploys in software. They were all automatically instantiated in real time as the developer was taking actions. So if I just go back to this slide, the business had an idea. The idea was, let's get into the restaurant rating business. The developer built the application and then invoked some APIs to deploy that application using Kubernetes. In the background, IT had a set of policies, like this is how we firewall a three-tier application. Those policies were created, some tags were applied to the, the, the policies so that when the Kubernetes deployment happened, it picked up all the appropriate policies from NSX. NSX automatically did everything under the covers to put in place the correct networking and security and it was all completely seamless as far as the developer was concerned. So the whole thing took two minutes, right? There was no IT in the critical path, so the developer didn't have to sit around waiting for something to happen. The developer got everything they needed, but it was done in a way that was compliant with all the IT policies. So again, IT is out of the critical path, IT is just as important as, as IT has ever been, but the developer experience is, I want to do something, it happens, I use my favorite tools, it all works. The IT experience is, we want to make sure that all the right things are happening for the business, we want to make sure that we're deploying things correctly, securely, etc. IT gets to do what they want, developers get to do what they want. And the policies follow the application. This is really important. So uh, that was a trivial application. It had three containers. They were all deployed probably in one place. But I could take that same scenario and scale out the application to have 100 containers. Those policies would automatically get scaled out without any involvement from IT. The developer can just say, oh, I should build a bigger deployment. It's one line change to my YAML file and then redeploy. I can even automatically have it scale out in response to demand. All of these things can be done and IT doesn't do anything because their policies naturally do whatever the application needs. So there's enormous efficiency here and enormous protection against bad things happening because you're automatically getting the right thing without taking any manual action. Again, this sort of ties back to some stuff Pat talked about this morning about good cyber hygiene. The idea that you need to automate everything so that you can not have human error letting problems happen further down the road. So this entire website's devoted to photos like the one I'm just showing. Um, this is uh, developers and IT working together in harmony, something perhaps we don't see so often in the real world, but this is really the opportunity that we have to enable our companies to embrace digital transformation and to do it in a way that makes sure that IT is more relevant and more valuable than ever because we're doing all the things that the business needs and enabling the business to move more quickly and enabling developers to be agile, use modern tools and not see IT as an impediment, but rather as an enabler. So that kind of brings us on to the people and process. So, if we think about networking, you know, Pat made a really interesting comment this morning. He said, if you're not using NSX today, you're already behind. Now, the, you know, there's a pretty obvious agenda there. We do obviously want NSX to be more broadly adopted. The majority of networks today are not managed with NSX. I, I say that you know, as a person who tracks the deployment pretty closely. However, NSX was part of the 10 largest deals that VMware did in the last quarter. So it is increasingly becoming very central, but there's still a big long tail of customers who haven't yet adopted NSX. Um, so what that means is that the way most people are interacting with networking today is still kind of the old way. You know, so I spent 16 years working for the other Cisco, the one that starts with a C, that builds routers and people build their entire career around being an expert on how the Cisco CLI works. How many people here are um, CCIEs? Congratulations to those people for studying hard and learning incredibly complicated syntax. The, 
the things you learn there will be valuable for the rest of your career, but the way to interact with networking has to change from a world in which the CLI is the primary way to interact with a network. So the cool thing about moving networking into software is it opens up networking to a broader group of people to interact with it. You can now interact with, with NSX or a network virtualization system through a range of different interfaces. You can go to the user interface, which is a nice GUI that we saw in the demo, or you can go directly through APIs, which is effectively what the developer was doing, and you can write your own scripts. We, we actually provide a whole lot of libraries, so you can write your own Python, for example, to interact with NSX, or you could use a cloud management platform as a layer of software sitting above NSX, as many of our customers do, so that you don't interact directly with the network, but rather you interact with a system that then provisions the network automatically. So there are lots of different ways to interact, and what this gives you is a repeatable way of deploying networks. Just like the YAML file defined the way the Kubernetes application got deployed, you can now start to have templates or pieces of code that define how networking gets deployed. And this means no human error, repeatability. You can deploy the same networking capability in dev, in test, in production without any risk of error. There's huge advantages to provisioning networking in this new way rather than doing it through the old CLI-based way. And effectively, the same things that are available for IT are available for developers. They may be trying to achieve different things. Developers may want to build the application, but they're still ultimately able to invoke the APIs, again, maybe indirectly through something like Kubernetes or perhaps through something like a Heat or a Terraform template that will then tell NSX what, what needs to be done. But again, consistency, repeatability, automation, and agility, the ability to do these things very quickly, now become available to both developers and IT people. So this is really changing the sort of the people aspect of networking from networking being something that only the handful of CCIE experts can do to something that a broader community of people can do. And I don't want to diminish the value of a CCIE. It's a, it's a phenomenal thing to have. However, there, there is a a lot of advantage for the organization to having networking become something that's more integrated into the way the organization works. And so effectively, what we're able to do now is to start breaking down silos. And I think that's a Las Vegas video of an old casino going down. We're able to say, you know, the networking team doesn't have to be siloed off from the rest of IT. So something we increasingly see when people start to deploy NSX, it's frequently deployed by the virtualization team. Now the virtualization team starts to have a say in networking, or else the existing networking team starts to expand into virtual networking, so they start to have more interaction with the compute team, and now you can start to also bring in the storage team. We have a lot of customers who have built a cloud architecture team, so they start to blend people from all the traditional silos because at the end of the day, it's not about having the best network. It's about having the best business. And the business needs networking to support the needs of the business, which means you need to be thinking about not just is my network really good, but is the broader set of things that the business needs, are those things getting delivered? So I think there's a very positive message here that we have the opportunity here to really change the way we as IT people interact with the business. We can break down silos and have a more functional organization where people work across boundaries and we can improve processes by automating things to re reduce complexity and to increase repeatability to remove the opportunities for human error. You know, people often talk about automation as a thing that's trying to do people out of a job. But again, to refer back to something Pat said this morning, this is about creating more high value jobs. If you can automate a process to make it more repeatable, you can do that process more often. You can do it with fewer errors and less downtime. So now you can do things better. And that now means your business can be focused on true innovation rather than just trying not to, you know, not to create bugs. You know, why did it traditionally take weeks 
to make a change to the network. It's not the actual set of tasks themselves that took weeks. It was that nobody wanted to do any change to the network except in a change window at 2 a.m. on Sunday. Because if you made a mistake, the consequences were horrendous. But now you just saw in my demo a whole lot of changes to networking that happened in real time. We didn't wait till 2 o'clock on Sunday morning. We did it when we needed it. And there was no risk of taking something down because all of those networking functions were explicitly scoped to a single application. So we're automating things so that we can do a much better job, do, do more with networking, meet more needs of the business, and avoid error. And so ultimately, this puts IT in a much better position. I think, you know, one of the sort of scary things of the last few years, there have been these articles that have said, you know, IT is going to become irrelevant. And, you know, the thesis was, who needs an IT department? You just go to the cloud and get everything. And I think we realize now the backlash to that is pretty strong and pretty valid, that you can't simply say, oh, I'm taking everything to the cloud. You need to maintain your legacy applications. You need to keep on doing all the things that we talked about, like security and compliance. So it isn't like the cloud's a silver bullet that suddenly makes every problem easy. It's that it gives you a new tool in the toolbox, but you still need to be able to do a whole lot of things to manage workloads and to enable innovation. So I think there's a huge opportunity for IT to be more relevant than ever. And I think one reason why we feel good about the overall cloud strategy of VMware is because we're bringing it to customers who want to go to the cloud and realize that going to the cloud is not just a simple, oh, spin up a, th a thing on Amazon. <clears throat> So, new approach to networking, greater value to the business. So, I, I know I said I didn't want to talk too much about developers, but I did talk a fair bit about developers and applications. How many people here have in-house developers building applications for their organization? So, probably a third of the room. So, so this slide is for the, the rest of you, really, that there's a, a whole lot of things that you can get from taking this new approach to networking, whether or not you have in-house developers. First of all, you've now got networking that's independent of the underlying infrastructure. So if there's one thing that should be obvious now is that we can't afford to hug our own infrastructure. The business is almost certainly going to embrace other clouds as well as private infrastructure. We see most of our customers ending up with a mixture of public and private infrastructure. There will be new application architectures, whether they are developed by your in-house developers or by outside organizations and you consume those applications, there will be new application architectures. You don't want to have a networking system that was designed for yesterday's application architectures. And I can't tell you what applications will look like next year, but I can tell you that if you build flexible infrastructure, you'll be able to ad adapt to whatever comes down the road. So having your networking be something that meets the needs of applications rather than something that's tied to a particular piece of infrastructure, to a particular set of boxes, is hugely empowering whether or not you have developers in your team. There's also you know, a huge change in security. And again, this is not a security-focused talk, but clearly one of the reasons why networking is important is because networking and security are so tightly coupled you need to be able to deliver security to where the application is running. Today, that application could be running in your data center, or it could be running in AWS, or it could be running in Azure, and tomorrow it could be running in some other cloud that we haven't heard of yet. It could be running in a VM, it could be running in a bare metal machine, it could be running in a container. The nature of network virtualization <clears throat> is that we can deliver security services directly to the application wherever it runs. Again, think of the Kubernetes example. I spun up a bunch of containers and I deployed security policies that were specific to how one container talked to another. So this is a really powerful thing that, you know, you think of VMware as a company that focuses on VMs, but we are actually delivering security capabilities today to containers. And of course, I haven't really talked about this very much at all, but because NSXT is designed to support all these new things like clouds and containers, it's important to remember it also supports multiple hypervisors. Now, of course, we want everybody to run vSphere, 
but in the real world, people have a mix of hypervisors. So for as long as I've been at VMware, we've had support for multiple hypervisors. And we continue to do that just because we realize the world is complicated and that it's important that we can deliver these capabilities wherever your workload runs. So again, this is a slide, you would have seen a version of this in this morning's keynote. We've actually been using this slide for over a year. This year, with the launch of NSXT 2.0, this actually is a really true picture of what we're doing. There's maybe one or two pieces here that are still in the vision piece, but most of this is reality today. So we have the ability to support multiple hypervisors in your on-premises environment, the ability to deliver security to end users on their phones and tablets and laptops, the ability to support new application frameworks like Kubernetes, as you saw in the demo, the ability to deliver networking and security services across multiple clouds, whether those clouds are running vSphere or whether they're running native stacks delivered by the, the Amazons and, and Googles of the world. And we're also increasingly focusing on how NSX can be used to deliver networking and security to branch and edge and IoT environments. And if that's something you're interested in, it's certainly a hot topic, the idea of you know, how do I extend networking and security out to my branch, there'll be other sessions later in the week that you can go to go deeply on that. So you know, the, the thing that we see here is once you, you start thinking of networking differently, you think of it as a set of services delivered in software to your application wherever it runs on whatever platform, whatever cloud, whatever framework. Now you've got a very powerful way to start embracing all these new opportunities. And so networking has this enormously powerful scope to affect the way your business runs. So to, to, sum, to summarize, you have the ability to be central to your organization's success. You can enable digital transformation in your organization by adopting a new way of thinking about how networking and security services are delivered to meet the needs of the application. You can do this in a way that meets the traditional needs of IT, around security, compliance, managing cost, availability, but also enabling the agility and the new tools like public clouds and containers that are necessary for a business to really disrupt itself. To do this, you do need to think differently about networking. You need to get out of the, the mode where networking comes in boxes and you need to think about networking as networking comes in software and you deploy it where your applications are. And so what I would urge you to do since we're early in the VMworld week is if you've got anything interesting out of today, and I hope you did, you should go and learn more about the aspects of NSX that sound interesting to you and see how you can apply it in your, in your work because I do think there's something here for almost everybody to make a difference to how their, their business runs. Um, I just want to call out one particular session tomorrow, the Transform Networking and Security Showcase. Uh, that'll be Tom Korn and some other folks. Tom is a totally amazing speaker and you will see really good information about what we're doing to change security, which as I said, is kind of very tightly coupled with networking. So I definitely encourage you to go and do that. You may have noticed we, uh, we announced the availability of a whole lot of cloud services today. You can actually now go and try them out on, I think it's cloud.vmware.com. You can actually start playing with the cloud services, including NSX delivered as a cloud service. Um, and of course, you're here surrounded by NSX experts. So go talk to them and go attend some sessions. You have a great opportunity to learn some cool stuff this week. With that, I'm done. Thank you very much. I'm happy to stick around for questions. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of microphones in the aisles. If you'd like to walk up to those, I will take questions from those who, uh, who want to do so. Um, please do fill out a survey uh, so we can figure out how to make these sessions better in, in the future. And uh, hopefully this was valuable. Thanks a lot. Yeah, hi, I have a question. Uh, so NSX, as I understand, is more of a overlay uh, functionality. Uh, is there any roadmap on the uh, underlay, to be precise? Yeah, that, so NSX is, is an overlay. Um, what's our roadmap for, for sort of dealing with the underlay? So today we do typically think of the underlay as something that should be managed separately in the sense that you should build a stable underlay and you know, leave it alone as much as possible and then deliver all the dynamic services on top using the overlay. The primary interaction that we have with the underlay 
is when people need a high performance edge connected to NSX, then we, we have the VTEP integ integrations that you're probably familiar with. Um, but we, we have not found a compelling reason to get NSX deeply involved with the underlay because the underlay typically is quite stable. The one area where we did really focus was on how you can jointly manage the underlay and the overlay. And for that, we use VRNI, which gives you a very nice tool for finding out the correlation between what's going on in the overlay and the underlay. Great, great question. Other, other questions? Very shy audience. Yes. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, okay, so if I could summarize your question briefly for those who didn't hear, I'd say it's roughly sort of how do you change your mindset from that of a traditional networking person to a virtual networking person and what are the resources to help you do that? Um, so, you know, and as it should be clear, I am somebody who has gone through that transformation myself, um, having grown up in the traditional networking world. Um, I do think there's no substitute for just getting hands-on with a network virtualization system. So things like taking an NSX hands-on lab, you know, you can do that from the comfort of your desk at home, or you can do it here while you're in, in VMworld. So hands-on lab is a great way to get some, some exposure. And, and there was a sort of embedded in your question, there's kind of what things should I learn to let go of? Um, and I think that's a, that's a great way of thinking of it. Um, if I was to say, what's one thing you should let go of? It's let go of the idea that the CLI is the best way to interact with a, with a system. And for me, you know, one reason I was able to, to give up on that was because for the entire time that I worked at Cisco, which was 16 years, we were really determined to find a better way to let people interact with the boxes other than the CLI, but we couldn't get the customers to let go of the CLI. So anytime we did a feature, CLI support always came first and everything else was an afterthought. So, so I think that is a fundamental shift in mindset. The CLI is not the best way to interact with networks. How do you get convinced that that's true? Experience it through a different lens. Go and use the NSX UI, for example, in the, in the hands-on lab. Um, that would be, be a good way of doing it. Um, if, you've, if you really want to be serious about this, we offer a whole range of training to take people from like CCIE to uh, VCDX. So you can make a sort of a lateral move from being an a, you know, industry leading networking expert to being an industry leading network virtualization expert. And because we, we assume those people already know what a router is and you know what BGP is, it's a relatively quick path compared to a traditional path to get to VCDX you know, with that network virtualization specialty. And there's equivalent things you can do at lower layers. But, so there is a lot of formal training to go up the certification path on the network virtualization side. So those are a couple of ideas. Um, I think the other thing I guess I'll say is that we've found it's tremendously helpful when people find a tactical project inside their business that will benefit from NSX and do a small deployment and see what happens. So you don't need to go and stop doing traditional networking. You say, I've got a tactical need. I need to go and deal with a security issue. I'm gonna do micro segmentation for this set of workloads. Then you get to experience how NSX works. You can see how it interacts with your physical hardware and, and make the, the leap from there. And we often see people then coming back and saying, oh, now I get it. I'm gonna do these other two projects with NSX now. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the question is for the, for the opposite angle, if you don't have a networking background, how do you get you know, sort of up the stack with, with NSX? Um, absolutely, we offer that kind of training. That's actually probably the more common case for us that more people come to NSX from a virtualization background. And so, you know, then you have the advantage that you don't need to be, you don't need somebody to explain what vSphere is. Um, you can sort of come through, oh, I, I see all these things in vCenter. And now I see there's a few extra things there that I can use to, to deploy security services or things like that. So there are training classes for that. Again, 
you know, for the last, I think, four years when I've gone to the VMworld hands-on lab, the NSX sessions tend to be the most popular. Um, so you'll find probably half a dozen different options for an NSX hands-on lab. You could go and do any one of those and it will be you know, a pretty straightforward thing to go through if you're familiar with, uh, with vSphere. Yeah, another question. Yeah, so, so what, about, um, what about our NFV strategy? So um, we, we have, I think, an entire section of our website you know, devoted to NFV solutions. Um, and again, there will definitely be good sessions this week on, on NFV. Um, but so I, I think the, you know, the NFV space is something I've spent a bit of time in. It is, it is quite a complex space. Um, and so rather than try to sort of give you a, an answer here, I'll just say you will be able to get um, you know, some information from going to sessions this week, but probably not as much as there would be on other aspects of NSX. And of course, NFV is much broader than, than NFV. Um, sorry, let me say that again. NFV is much broader than NSX. Um, and for, you know, for example, one of the announcements we made today was around a new release of VMware integrated OpenStack. And so that's one of the key parts of our telco strategy. Uh, so, you know, that would be an area you could go and explore that would give you some exposure to our telco strategy. Um, but actually, if you want to follow up with me later, I can actually introduce you to some of the, the Tolco NFV team. That might be the easiest. Um, yep, one more question. I'm going to get kicked out in a few minutes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, so if, if I were a Cisco person, how would I, how would I sort of argue against the VMware strategy? Um, so, I, this happens to me a lot, actually. I'll go into a customer and you know, they had a meeting with Cisco the previous week, and so I hear these arguments quite a lot. So the, the most frequent criticism that I've heard is it's really hard to troubleshoot the interaction between the overlay and the underlay. That was probably a legitimate criticism two years ago um, before we had VRNI. Um, it's not a legit criticism anymore, but um, you know, we don't sell the overlay and the underlay. Um, and so we have to d b deliver tooling to help you understand what's going on with the underlay and the overlay. You know, Wireshark, as a simple example, also understands how to troubleshoot an overlay network. So it's not actually rocket science, but that is the, probably the most frequently heard argument is, oh, it's really hard to troubleshoot an overlay, unless, of course, you run the completely vertically integrated Cisco overlay. Um, so, so that's one argument. Um, second argument is typically around um, well, they don't support enough, you know, they, they really only focused on vSphere. Um, well, if you got one thing out of today's talk, other than the Kubernetes stuff, I would say we're obviously focused on a lot more than vSphere. Again, historically, you know, we focused on vSphere because that's where our customers are. But, you know, one of the things we're trying to do here is make sure that as the world changes, we don't say, if you're on vSphere, we help you. If you don't work on vSphere, you're out of luck. So, so that story, again, any good criticism has to have a grain of truth, right? And so we have had that you know, one in the past. Um, let's see, what, what would I say is the third one? Um, I, I, not so much these days, but I used to hear the, oh, well, you know, these centralized controllers don't scale. Um, and so if you were to come to my talk tomorrow, um, where I'm going to go considerably deeper on NSXT, um, you'll hear a lot about how we actually architect a system to scale. Um, it's certainly not trivial to build a scalable network virtualization system, but you know, we've worked on this for a long time and we do know how to do it. So again, there's a, a sort of a grain of truth there, but I think we've, we've got a good answer for that that I can give you more detail on tomorrow. And if you really enjoyed my presentation and want to hear me talk on a different topic tomorrow, um, I think it's at 11.30. It's called The Future of Networking and Security with NSXT. And I think at that point, I'm out of time. They need to clear the room. So uh, thank you very much for your, for your time. And uh, if you enjoyed the session, do fill out a survey.